Welcome to this episode of Against the Mountains of Madness. I'm your host, Jason. And I'm John C. Wright. And on this episode, we thought we'd discuss misunderstandings about the Catholic Church. We'll be polite. <laughs> so, I would have called it misinformation about the Catholic Church. Well, that, we can debate what the title should have been. It's all good. Um, but first, why we wanted to discuss this. Um, I became a Catholic a few years ago now. And what I, well, what I discovered on my journey to the Catholic Church was Protestants believe a lot of things that just aren't so. Um, as Ronald Reagan would say, <laughs> the problem isn't what they believe, it's that they believe things that just aren't so. And really aggressively at times, um, I was certainly told many things that were just have turned out to be completely false about the Catholic Church. Um, so we thought we'd try to, and I did a poll of some people on Facebook to get some, get what people mostly um, had an issue with. So we've, we've culled from that list a bit. We won't get to everything, sorry. Um, and certainly when I crossed the Tiber and announced it, I was then immediately set upon by some people I thought were friends of mine um, about, oh, you obviously never knew the gospel. Oh, you've, you know, you've abandoned Christ. Oh, and, oh, the Catholic Church believes all these things. Clearly, it's the den of Satan. And it's, it's crazy stuff. I mean, it made me sad. But anyway. From my perspective, since I came to Catholicism from being a, a stark, vituperative atheist, <laughs> uh, my atheist friends didn't like the fact that I believed in the supernatural, but beyond that, they didn't care which part of the supernatural I believed in. Uh, and by and large, my Protestant friends have been mostly nice, but they also suffer from extreme misinformation. And I mean really extreme. Mm. Uh, my, my experience was similar to yours. Nearly everything I heard a Catholic tell me was something a Protestant believed, when I talked to a Protestant, that turned out to be something a Protestant actually did believe. When I talked to a Protestant and they told me what Catholics believed, all, in almost no case was it something that the Catholics actually believed. Mm. You see? So, the, uh, to, to me, the difference is, I, I, when I was trying to pick a denomination, I didn't want to relitigate the entire 16th century. But certain basics had to stand out, and I did have to pick a denomination. I, you know, I, I, I wanted to go to a house of worship and worship the Lord... But you Christians decided to have a quarrel and break, you know, get a divorce and break up. Mm. And so I had to pick between whether to go to the mother church or, or, or some other place, you see. Yes. So, uh, but I, I think that any Protestant who's willing to, to give us a listen should at least understand that, that the things you thought were bedrock Catholic principles and that every historian agreed was something the Catholic Church said or did. Uh, I'm sorry, it's just not the case. It's very rarely it's, the case. Yeah. I, I, let me also add... We're English speakers. The English-speaking world has been Protestant since the time of King Henry VIII. Mm. So almost everything written in English is going to be written from a Protestant point of view, either actively or, or unknowingly. Mm. Just making certain Protestant assumptions about what the, what the church is and what she teaches. Okay. If, if, if the, reason why I became, the reason why I lost my atheism was because I believed Christ was what he said he was. And the reason why I became a Catholic is that I, became, is that I believe the church is what she says she is. Not what, not what someone else says she is. But you have to listen to her to find out what she says she is. Hmm. So the first one that came up a bunch uh, and seems to be the bone of contention is the accusation that uh, Protestants believe in salvation by faith and Catholics believe in salvation by works. Um, n neither of these are strictly true uh, once you understand what each side means by what they're saying. Um, certainly... One of the things I learned as a one of the things I discovered as a Protestant was Catholics and Protestants use language a little bit differently. And after, a, a very, you have uh, a gift for understatement. Well, they, they they mean different things by the same words. They, they, yeah. There's no way they can there's no way they can they can see eye to eye unless they agree on their definitions. But but usually usually um, what I've noticed is when they disagree. The Protestant will accuse the Catholic of something. The Catholic will accuse the Protestant of something. And if, if the if the Catholic meant by what they were saying what the Protestant meant by what they were saying, the Protestant accusation would be accurate and vice versa. But they don't. They're talking past each other. Um, what I well, can you, do? You have an example in mind? I do, well, the one that the one that I'd heard about, but the one that really became crystal clear to me after I became a Catholic was. Um, Essentially, how Protestants and Catholics look at salvation, um, how they frame the issue. And I've, I've come to think the Protestants actually make a really big mistake framing it the way they do. And I'll get to that. But essentially, 
when a Protestant says salvation, they mean an event at the start of their journey of being a Christian. And when a Catholic says salvation, they mean the process of becoming a saint and entering the beatific vision. Um, I In other words, the Protestant says, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And the moment you say yes, that's, that's it. Sort of, yeah, basically. That's, that's what salvation is. De depending when, on depending on the exact Protestant and are you regenerate first and there's, there's a whole lot of arguments about it but basically it's that event at the start that's when you're saved but yes and the Catholics think well the Catholics seem to frame it more as well, when you get to heaven and enter the beatific vision of God that's that's salvation that's that's when you're saved right. um, and right. as a result so <clears throat> it leads to weird things because Protestants there's a Protestant analogy of this thing called forensic justification, and it's described as, forgive me anybody where I have this confused, this is a real Protestant analogy and forensic justification is a thing, I think I have this right. And they describe uh, being justified before God as being a turd covered in fresh fresh snow. Like you're still corrupt and sinful, but you've, you're covered in the, the white snow of Christ sort of thing and made pure, which is weird. But um, but I think where the confusion about the faith and works things comes in is the Catholic looks at it like, yes, I put my faith in Christ, that's the start of the journey, and then I go and get baptized, I go to church, I receive the sacraments, which is all just more grace, more grace from God, mm -hmm. and I do the good works God puts in front of me to do, again, a gift from God, mm -hmm. but with the cooperation of my will, and mm -hmm. as you make choice, I mean, C.S. Lewis put it really well. He talked about every person you meet is one of two things. They're either, they will either in the end, they will become a creature you would be tempted to fall down and worship, which is a saint in the beatific vision, mm -hmm. or a, a horror just out of your worst, darkest nightmares. Um, right. And I, I agree with that, but... Um, but that's because every day you're choosing either for God or against or away from God and for self. You like the end of the journey ends in one of two places. You either end entirely for self, which is like uh, Dante's vision of Satan in hell raging and all about himself or and crying. Well, Dante's version of of, uh, of of Satan in heaven, he's weeping because he's he's in pure misery. Okay. Or you get fully out of self and fully focused on God. And every day is a choice. And these right. are the works, in a sense, because that's what you're doing. You're working, I mean, you're working towards your salvation, sort of, but it's in cooperation with God. It's your will coming into alignment with God, effectively. Right. And that's, it's sort of a work, as best I, I can tell, As best I can tell, the difference, the difference between the soul scriptura, excuse me, belay that, uh, 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 salvation by faith alone and salvation by faith and works is that both sides, both Protestants and Catholics, believe that work are is part of the Christian life. Yeah. Catholics seem to think it is a necessary part that you would naturally want to do good works, works of charity to others, if you were if you love your brothers as yourself. Hmm. Okay. The the um, the the Lutherans at least I was raised Lutheran so I can't speak to the other Protestants. The Lutherans at least say that that you are so unregenerate, you are so reprobate, you are so sinful, that you can't even conceive the desire to do good works without the grace of God. And I believe Catholics would generally agree with that. that yeah, that charity is a is a gift, a grace from God. Mm. Uh, but that faith and faith alone is what is what saves you. Well, but then my Lutheran friends also say that if you are filled with faith, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to want to do good works naturally anyway. So it sounds to me like one of them is just saying faith and works is part of the salvation and the other one is saying faith is the only part of the salvation you need, but the works comes along with it and it's a good thing too. Well, see. Now, yeah, keep in mind, sort of. these arguments are extremely subtle and, based, and are based on technical distinctions that I didn't make in my one minute sum up. So I have just misspoken. I've just spread more misinformation about well, both sides. But the, I, I think the end result, the end result of, the Catholic, of, a, of a Christian life is going to be basically the same. It's just that they have different opinions as to whether which is whether one is necessary versus sufficient, or whether one is part and parcel of it, or could be you know excused. I myself believe that a hermit who goes away from human society and never gives alms in his life, but spends his life in prayer, could still get into heaven. I don't think that yeah. I don't think that uh, alms giving is necessary for salvation, but 
You probably want to do it anyway. Well, it would be, it would be part of making those steps towards God. Everyone will have a different journey, but right. everybody's on this. Everybody's headed to the same destination. But the thing is, um, but the start of that journey is putting your faith in Christ. That's the first step. So, I, but I think this is where the confusion. The, the thing is, though, I've seen Protestants tie themselves into knots, insisting that being baptized is a work so it doesn't count towards your salvation just all these things they like they t they absolutely tie themselves into crazy knots trying to make sense of faith and works and it seems like but no protestant i've ever met like so if you were to say okay well i've put my faith in jesus and now i'm going to go and lead um satan pride rallies and perform <laughs> perform live abortions during them and then consume the fetus as an unholy eucharist but i said i have i put my faith in jesus so i'm saved and i don't know a protestant that would turn around and go well who knows i'm, I'm sure you could find someone but most protestants would go well no of, of course you're not saved I think most Protestants would say that's not really what their doctrine is. They, they, they think that you're saved by faith, but that the faith will then start to work in well, no, you. No, it will, no. will have certain side effects. Well, no, no, but that's my point. Yeah. Like, like, no, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I don't know anybody that would say, well, no, that person would be saved. Like, no, no obviously not. Um, but also, like, you can't... Part of the accusation that the faith first works things goes into is, oh, you can earn your way to heaven. It's like, no, 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 um, no Catholic believes that. No, no Catholic no. says that. No Catholic teaches that. Um, e even even if we concede for the sake of argument and because there's shades of meaning that your works materially contribute to your salvation. And if you don't participate in the works, you probably won't get there. You still you still need Christ. You can't get on the elevator. Like there's an elevator to heaven and there's no other way to heaven. And that elevator is Jesus. That, and if you, right. if you don't get on the elevator, you can't get there. You can get off right. the elevator if you want. You can decline to get on the elevator, but you can't build a staircase. Um, the problem is most of, most of the distinction between Protestant and Catholic on this issue is a semantic argument. It is. What the, the the part that's not a semantic argument is what's the role of the church in good works? Because the Protestants' whole shtick is that they don't recognize church authority over, mm. over anything like this. They don't think they don't think giving alms to the church is like giving alms to the poor or something. And maybe I'm maybe now I'm mis misunderstanding their, their doctrine also. Uh, now they seem to think that we think if you throw a coin in the box you're going to you're going to buy souls out of purgatory. And other things like that, which which just by the way was never an official church teaching, no. uh, and and in fact, as best I can tell from my from my cursory study of history, only one fundraiser, <laughs> not even a church official, mm. ever made that claim, and he did it as a joke. He did it as a rhyme to to try to get people to cough up their their pennies for uh, uh, for uh, uh, their tithe for almsgiving. Mm. But I don't believe any Protestant frowns at almsgiving, nor do the Muslims, nor, nor so. It's it's clearly a part of the Christian life. Yeah. Now, is it is it necessary? If I if I converted to Christianity in the, on a rowboat in the middle of the ocean and never had a chance to do a good work and was immediately swallowed by a, a whirlpool, okay, I I don't believe any Catholic would say, oh, that guy can't go to heaven because he didn't do any good works. No. I, I, that's not a teaching of our church. That's no. not what we say. Of course. But not. if he gets to land and he and he steps on a beggar and says, get out of my way, <laughs> beggar, why did you choose to be born poor? No, that guy does not does not show Christian spirit. That guy is probably not going to go to heaven because he's, no, he's, he's still choosing with, the wrong he's still way with wrath and ego. <laughs> yeah, he's, right. Now, Christ was told that that no man, the people that God puts in His hand, no man is going to be plucked out of His hand. No, but we, the Calvinists, say that means you're safe no matter what. Mm. Some Calvinists. Uh, I've heard a Catholic priest say that doesn't mean you can't jump out by your own yeah. works. I mean, it's all I external. don't think. I don't think Judas went to hell. I mean, excuse me, went to heaven. I think Judas, if he had uh, if he had repented before he hanged himself, maybe, but uh, he didn't, at least according to the record we as have. As far as we know, yeah. Okay. And he was a bishop. I mean, you might not, you might not, he was an apostle. He was one of the 12. Yeah. Okay, he was, his, he was Christ's chum, his best friend. He understood what was going on. So. I would, oh, um. And this to touch on something a friend was asking about that I think is related to this is the doctrine of purgatory. Um, 
She asked for biblical evidence for purgatory. I will make a very simple argument. That's already that's already a slanted question because you're assuming that Christians only believe things that are in the Bible, well, which is just that's that's a, that's a Protestant. Uh, uh, True. That's a heterodox Protestant innovation to the faith. But that's okay. Obviously, I, obviously the early Christians before the Bible was canonized didn't 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 abide by that. But really. I will I will I will accept the so. terms. I will accept the terms. Purgatory. So um, to clear a few things out of the way. Um, purgatory is not a second chance. Everybody in purgatory is going to heaven. Everyone, everyone in purgatory right. is already saved. You're already um, saved, right? So now think back to what I said about um, salvation as a process. You come to faith, then you you choose for God the rest of your life, and eventually you become a saint and enter the beatific vision. That's that salvation is a process and it works over time. Unless you are completely free from sin at your, and detached detached from sin. Um, and have no desire for sin at the end of your life, which I would say, in fairness, almost nobody has. I'm sure you can find. What if you're run over by a streetcar right after you step out of the confessional booth? Sure, there's, there's, there's <laughs> sure that's fine. But I mean, like, okay, there's corner cases. You can always find corner right. cases, but most people are not right. perfect. But most, but even if you've been to the confession, you're probably not perfectly detached from sin. You're you're forgiven. Your sins are cleansed, but 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 being a saint's a little more than that um right right and if you believe nothing as revelation states clearly nothing holy can enter enter the presence nothing unholy can enter the presence of god mm -hmm. if you at your death are not perfectly holy which you probably aren't and you can't enter the presence of god unless you're perfectly holy there, there needs to be a step between those two there needs to be a finishing process for but you wouldn't to get the over Protestants the line. say? Wouldn't the Protestants say that process was done on Calvary by Christ? It doesn't need to be done by you. Was, isn't that the Protestant argument? But if salvation is a process of choices, you need to finish making the choices. If it's a, if it's not, a, if it's not an instantaneous event, it's a process, which I think, in practice, everyone believes it is. Um, then there's that final refining step that may be necessary. Um, but the thing is, purgatory. If you understand the actual doctrine of purgatory is quite limited it's if you mm. are if you are if you are saved but imperfectly holy then there needs to be a cleansing process that can happen in this life it's, that can happen in the next life it's more technical than that if you have earthly obligations or a punishment an earthly punishment that you haven't fulfilled or an earthly oath you haven't fulfilled purgatory is where those things are fulfilled Okay. The, the divine the divine lapses that you've made have, have already been forgiven and those don't need to be burned away in purgatory mm. you see so there is actually a, a, once again a very subtle legalistic distinction and also and I think a, I think a lot of the reasons why a lot of Protestants misunderstand Catholicism is that we they ignore the distinctions we make uh, you know between but, between between a and B where, where a and a is not the same as B hmm but also purgatory is not yeah. purgatory is not the place where you earn your way into heaven no, <laughs> for, exactly. for example that's not exactly. what we teach exactly not it's, it's not that but also importantly um the official teaching is purgatory is, is uh purgatory is officially a process it could be it could be an right. instantaneous process it could take time there could be a place called purgatory there may not it's not actually the only the only the only strict teaching is if you are imperfectly holy, there will be some sort of cleansing process before you can enter the presence of God. That's it. That, that's it, the whole. It might be. That's it what might you have be to as being to. instantaneous as being flung into a holy blast furnace and just having all your sins burned away in an instant. It could or be. it might be something as long and complicated as, as walking up the mountain of Mount Purgatory in Dante's in Dante's uh, uh, poem. I don't it, know. No, exactly. Don't know. We don't know. But here's what I do know. But there's no official here's what position. I do know. Yeah. The Book of Maccabees mentions prayers for the dead, and that's one of the books that the Protestants removed from the Bible. Hmm. Now, if you talk to a Protestant, he'll say, no, no, that book was never in the Bible. The Catholics just tried to smuggle it in. No, it was definitely okay. removed. It was 100% well, removed. Well, uh, yes, I know that, and you know that, but that's well, no, not wait, what they're told. Wait, wait, we should touch on that very briefly. Um, I learned this recently. Those books were in there. They were in the Vulgate. Jerome, St. Jerome, had issue, Jerome. Had, had issue with them a bit. Um, and there, you can find the odd person that takes issue with them, but Jerome submitted to the wisdom of the church. I mean, if you read the rest of Saint Jerome, you would not, you wouldn't be using him like you are <laughs> to make that argument. He's not. Uh, he's not known to be a doctor of the church, for one thing. Um, yeah, but but also he's not. 
And he's not the Pope. He's not infallible like the Pope. No, we don't what, have the doctrine of what, Jeromic Pope. What, what, what Let's talk about papal, infallibility, papal infallibility in a minute because it doesn't mean what you think it means. No, but also, um, but with the books being removed, the Protestants relegated them. They kept them, but they relegated them to a, to a separate section for a time. And then one of the Bible societies just arbitrarily decided not to include them anymore. That's why they're not really included in modern Protestant Bibles. Even Catholics call them deuterocanonical, which is just which is actually not a, the correct term. They they were canonical for fa, for over a thousand years. Well, it means and, second uh, canon. It means I mean like there's there's yeah, no, there's still. there's no historic there's no there's no question historically Protestants removed the books. Um, they'll argue for why they removed the books, but they they were not added by Catholics. If someone tells you that, either they're lying to you because they know better, or they've listened to someone who has told them a lie. Um, one thing, because one thing I, I, one thing I mentioned that I want to emphasize is that you and I are both English speakers from the English speaking world and the mm. English speaking world has been Protestant since the time of King Henry VIII. And we have heard a lot of lies about these things, mm. a lot of simplifications and a lot of straw man arguments so much so that it's, it's a part of English speaking tradition just to accept some of these ideas without examining them. Are we sure? I myself don't know, yeah. don't know of any, I myself do not know of any Protestant who th regards the deuterocanonical books as canon. No, but no, none of them. Even though, even though they are, and if and if asked why the Catholic Bible is bigger than the Protestant Bible, they'll say the Catholics corrupted it. Did Usually, that we did something wrong. Yeah, of course. But I mean, okay. Now the thing is, I, I should choose my words carefully. I am willing to accept most Protestants innocently believe lies about the Catholic Church. I have no problem with saying that, and just say, look. You don't know what you're talking about, and that's fine. I, let, here, let's have a discussion. That's why I wanted to emphasize that it's been this way for it's been this way since the 1600s. That, your chance of knowing, your chance of actually knowing what Catholics actually believe is really limited, unless you were like raised in Louisiana or something. <laughs> but I, but I would note there are a lot, there are a number of uh, insta uh, groups that set themselves up as apologetics ministries and stuff who will repeat repeat these false like these doctrines are false. They repeat yeah. them about the Catholic Church. And I would say these people are liars. They know. I mean, like, if you're going to set yourself up as an apologetics ministry, there's there's two options if you are going to say things that are false about the Catholic Church. Either you're a wolf in sheep's clothing, you know you are telling lies, or your scholarship is so unbelievably sloppy that, honestly, I wouldn't trust you to tell me what color the sky is outside because you're that incompetent. I I have to insist there's some people who are simply making an honest mistake. R.C. Sproul is a, is a theologian whom I admire. I've listened to him on, on many topics. But when he gets on the topic of, of uh, the, the difference between Protestant and Catholic, he goes off the rails for me. Hmm. Let me give you a specific example. He was asked once, how can the Bible be holy, how, authoritative and holy, if the church that, that canonized it is not authoritative and holy? The church wrote the Bible. The church wrote the canon. And then his response is, no, the canon wrote the church. No. By which he means that the writings established the spirit that established the church, and then when the church deviates from the spirit of the Bible, it's, it no longer has authority. Okay? Now, I, I believe his belief is sincerely held. I believe the man is an excellent scholar. But, but that answer strikes my ear as being merely absurd. What, well, what did they do? What did they do in the first five centuries of the of the church? Uh, if the if the if the scriptures created the church, I mean, uh, who who wrote it down? Who spread it? Who yeah. who said who said the shepherd of Hermas was not canonical and the uh, the gospel of the gospel of Luke was? Who said the gospel of Luke was canonical and the gospel of Thomas was not? The church. There w there wasn't anyone else. Hmm. You know, and this was and this was being done when the church was still illegal. I sh I should mention, you know, and the church recognized uh, recognized these books as scripture. That's actually the Catholic teaching. Right. The the church right. didn't select them; they recognized them no. as um, right scripture. Right. Like because again, because despite what people think, the the Pope and the uh, the College of Cardinals and so on merely recognize something that's believed by the main mass of believers that comes from the teachings of the apostles. That they taught to their to, to their students, and their students taught it to theirs. That's what apostolic succession is. Well, the, that's, in the ancient yeah. world, in the ancient world, the only way you knew that a teacher, let's say even of Aristotle or Stoicism, if you the only way to know that he was from the groves of academia or from the porch, was because was if his teacher taught your teacher taught his teacher, in like father to grandfather. Say, well, it's interesting. And you would say, yeah. 
so so in that case similarly when the catholics were first being spread and we didn't even call ourselves catholics then we didn't even call ourselves christians at the very first very first hmm. saint john was the apostle of christ and he taught saint polycarp hmm. saint polycarp was the kid who was on the lap of christ when christ said suffer the kids to come unto me and so the teaching of saint polycarp if someone said how do we know this is the teaching of christ he could say i heard it from john who heard it from christ and likewise, for, for the, the bishop that came after him, was taught by Polycarp, and, the, and, and mm. so on and so forth. And different cities in the ancient Roman world could say which, which of the apostles they can trace their lineage back to. In the mm. case of Rome, it was Peter and Paul, you know. Well, this is but, interesting. And so on. Um, this is interesting. In the early church, when someone would come along with, I've got this doctrine, Scripture, scripture says this, or, you know, um, and I understand Scripture to say the following, and the response you would get from um the leaders was show me where the it wasn't oh scripture says that it says show me where the apostles taught this like tra trace this back right. to trace this back to what the apostles taught um to an apostolic teaching right like yeah it's that 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 was how it was done in the early church greetings world this is john c wright i and my compatriot jason rennie take up arms weekly against the mountains of madness that are afflicting and overwhelming the modern age. You are welcome here among like-minded souls, and I hope we have provided a work of insight, hope, or humor, and perhaps an explanation of the insanity that is the modern age. For more content and conversation on these and other fascinating topics of philosophy, science fiction, and current events, please visit our substack at atmom.substack.com. Tips, bribes, and generous patronage are warmly encouraged. Thank you. Um, okay, right. this this brings us to another topic. But that, uh, I only brought that up because the the faith versus works is is one of those doctrines that goes mm. all the way back to the very earliest church, and the the role of the church as being the guardian of the tradition and the guardian of the Bible goes all the way back to the very mm. earliest church. See, so that's and, and the doctrine of purgatory is at least that old. So if you're going to say, well, it's not in the Bible, all I can say is the teacher has lecture notes, and if you're going to disagree with the teacher because his lecture notes disagree with him, the, the, the fact of the matter is the teacher didn't write everything down. And in the lecture notes, he says so. There's so many, there's so many works of Christ that are never going to be down, and so on and so yeah. forth. And if, but if you are going to say only what's in the Bible is something I'm going to believe because God would not be so cruel as to make me required to believe something that's not in the Bible you know, for my salvation... I'll say, sure, fine, but that, that at the same time, that doesn't mean that you get to pick what books are not in the Bible. If you say, there's no prayers to the dead, for the dead in the Bible, and I say, it's in the book of Maccabees, the of and Maccabees. then you say, no, I reject the book of Maccabees as authoritative, and I go, what about the letter of James? And they go, well, we reject the letter of James as authoritative. Okay, what? you're not, you're, you're, you're playing a trick on me when you, when you try to argue in that fashion. I mean, it's, it's probably rude, but I'm, I'll certainly be tempted next time it comes up, um, to someone I know rejects the deuterocanonical bottles and uh, canonical books and dismisses them as uh, not, as they don't count. Um, mm -hmm. And if when they quote Romans, I go, "Oh, Romans isn't in my Bible. I threw it out. It, I don't think it's. I don't <laughs> think it counts." My and, personal Bible. And just just respond that to everything. Now that would be unfair. Of the course, are gonna I mean, argue, it's deliberately unfair. Sure. Protestants are going to argue about the about the canonicity. They're going to say there are historical reasons why some books are not as well regarded as others. For, for one thing, Luther consulted with the Jews of his time to ask if the Jews had a Hebrew copy of certain particular books in the Bible. And if the Jews of the 16th century living in Germany didn't have a copy, he said this was not, this was not legitimate. All the church fathers who regarded this as legitimate are mistaken, and I'm, and I'm not mistaken. It's a weird flip. Okay. I've, I've heard... I've that, heard was his, that was his argument, at least. I've, I've heard that know. argument made, and all I can think is it's a weird flex to say... I am rejecting these books from the Bible because the people that rejected Christ and think he's boiling an excrement say they don't count. It's, it's a weird argument to me. The Jews, <laughs> that the Jews living in Germany in the 16th century were rabbinical Jews who, who, whose religion was started in the first or second century after the destruction of the temple. The, the, the temple-going Jews have, been, have not been going to the temple since 77 AD. Mm. You know, so whether they're the same religion or not is, is a bit of a debate. Fair enough. Okay. But I wouldn't. I would not ask them to for for a ruling on on <laughs> exactly. church theology, over and above what the church herself says she is and, mm. and, and has the authority to decide. So that's another major question: Does the church have magisterial authority? Does the church have, you know? Uh, so we should 
Yeah. Uh, you want to segue into talking about magisterial well, let, in, let, infallibility, paper let, infallibility? Let, let, let me set the scene here to put it in a bit of okay. perspective. So there are two doctrines, usually here papal infallibility, but there's a related doctrine called magisterial infallibility, which is probably more important. But um, so you hear people say, oh, I, suppose, I, I thought the Pope was supposed to be infallible when he said something stupid. Um, or, and my response is, you, and, but the doctrine of papal infallibility is, is quite limited and people that actually understand what it is know this. Um, so papal infallibility is the Pope can teach infallibility, infallibly, which just means author, effectively just means authoritatively, um, when speaking, uh, from the chair of Peter and it's, it's like, it's a very limited doctrine, like there's really specific criteria. If I may, you're, you're taking a long time to say a simple thing. Okay. The Pope, when teaching on faith and morals, if it is in accordance with the with the traditions of the church, can decree something infallibly ex cathedra when he's speaking from the chair of Peter. Thank you. Okay. But to put, and to put that in perspective, the question I always ask Protestants is how many papally infallible pronouncements are there? Like just and like you don't have to know exactly. None of them know. Just just none random. of them know well, that well, I've well, talked. To. Well, I will normally I will normally cheat a little bit and say just na just you know to the nearest hundred will do, um, because well you and I both know and Catholics know the the list of papally infallible doctrines is two, it's two. <laughs> That's exactly many, two. Many Catholics do not know that, and they are embarrassed by the doctrine of papal infallibility. Fair enough. Because they themselves because they're not properly catechized, think it means the Pope can do no wrong. Yeah, which is not doesn't it mean that at all. <laughs> I believe, did you, and let's remind our, our listeners what the two are. The two the are? Assumption of Mary, Mary and her Immaculate Conception. Immaculate Conception. And I mean, like... Things that have been believed by Catholics since the second century well, or the first century. And like, okay. you, you, uh, I would say you might want to argue about those doctrines, and that's fine. And we can and have... we did. It, and, well, no, no. We did argue about them for I, centuries. I'm, I, I'm happy to have a discussion about them, but like... In a, in a field, I mean, I think they're significant doctrines. I think they're important. But at the same time, they're also, in another sense, relatively minor doctrines. Like, I mean, yes. if you were to reject the Assumption of Mary and you were, or if you were to reject the Immaculate Conception, you mm. may be going to have some problems making sense of original sin. There's a reason the doctrine exists, but it's not going to change that much. If you If you reject the Assumption of Mary, again... It's not going to change that much in Christianity. I mean, I don't want to downplay right. them as important doctrines, but also, like, they're not going to change. It's it's not they, going to it's not me, going to me, it's, it's me, not going to change. Let me interrupt. They were so, not important enough to have an official decree uh, confirming them until the eighteen hundreds. Or the 19, or was it the nineteen hundreds? The eighteen hundreds for. Um, Assumption or no, for, no, uh, 18, 1800s, 1850 something, I think, for um, the Immaculate right. Conception and the 19, 1950 something for the Assumption of Mary. But now, before I want, oh, sorry, I want all my Protestant listeners to, to listen and understand what this this point we Catholics don't officially set something in stone until after it's been debated and only when someone disputes it. So, doctrines that have never been disputed throughout all history, if no one questions them until 1688 or something. Then we'll debate it, and if the and then after the a century or two massive, we'll get around to making massive, an answer. Yeah, and then another century or two we'll get around to making a decision. Right, but well, right, I have because we're not I, in a hurry. I have heard a Protestant speaker who was talking about the, you know, the errors of Catholicism say the Catholics invented the Assumption of Mary in 1956 when it was or 1950 whatever when it was made a dogma. <laughs> and all I would say in response to that is. The first crusade was launched on the assumption of Mary, on the feast of the Assumption of Mary. So, right. if the doctrine was invented in the nineteen fifties, are you saying the Catholic Church has a time machine? And if and it does, all, awesome. And who painted all the Renaissance <laughs> and uh, and sixteen hundreds uh, uh, exactly. pictures I mean, like, of the Assumption of Mary? But it's just it's a, it's a much older doctrine than that, and so it's just it's a it's a silly claim. Um, right. I believe it's called the Domitian of Mary. I might have that wrong in the Orthodox Church, but they have exactly the same teaching. Um, right. They call it by because slightly different name, but it, it's so it's why. so it goes like well, the doctrine goes pre before the Great Schism. Like it's older than right. that. It's at least a thousand years old. Right. 
And the, the reason why I want to emphasize that the church doesn't make a decree until after the issue has been thoroughly debated for thousands of years, and only about things that, that the finding is that it's something we've always believed since the get-go, okay, the, the idea that the moment the decree is made is when the church makes up their, their doctrine, that is akin to thinking, that's the 1776 version of the church where you think that a group of men sit down and write up a constitution out of mm. scratch, and then they agree on what the constitution should say, they argue about the wording, and then they sign their names to it, and the moment they sign their names, then it becomes the law, and before that it's not the law. No, that's not no. what goes on. <laughs> it's much more funny. similar to, in, in if I may use a legal analogy, I don't know if you're aware of this, but in Anglo-American law, if you cohabitate with a woman notoriously for seven years, you are considered married in the eyes of the law. Mm. Okay, it's called it's called a common law marriage. Even if you never swear an oath, you're you're considered married. It's, in the shorter, law. it's shorter than that these days. I think it's two years in Australia. But anyway, I, yes. It, I'm just telling you what the, what the traditional length was. So all the court in doing in a common law marriage is recognizing something that's already existing, and that if you got married in a, in a private ceremony, which there's no record, uh, and everyone and all your neighbors have always known you were married, and no one disputes that you're married, and no one thought you weren't married. They wouldn't even bring it up. No, who's going to bring that case to court unless someone says, no, no, they're not married. So the moment some innovator in the 1700s suddenly leaps up and says, wait a minute, there's no assumption of Mary. She clearly had left a, left a tomb in the Middle East somewhere that's the center of a gigantic uh, monument. And uh, people, per, pilgrims go there every year. They, it must be true. There must be, Mary's bones must be on earth somewhere. Okay, well, I'm sorry. That's not, that's a new doctrine. Qu the question, questioning it is the innovation. We're just relying on tradition. We're just we're just relying on what our fathers told us, and they're relying on what their fathers told them because that's the way you learn things in history. That's the way you learn the Christian teaching. Yes. You know. Oh, and, and fortunately, we wrote some of those things down and formed our Bible that we're allowing you guys to use. You know? <laughs> and this brings us to magisterial authority, which is unsettled teachings, much like you were saying. The church teaches right. authoritatively. Now, I would note. Oh, let me let me make one like one last oh, question sure, about please. papal papal infallibility. I think that's just a problem of the of the branding. I think it's just a problem of the wording, because what it is is that's the doctrine that the Pope can officially, while sitting in the chair of Peter, bring an end to the conversation. He can say the jury is in. We've heard all the evidence. We've debated it since the fifth century. This is what Catholics believe. This is what we believe. End of discussion. Okay, and like you just said. Every church has things they think are settled doctrine. Yeah. The only difference is we make an official ceremony out of it because Catholics are very officious and ceremonial. <laughs> okay. And there's no ambiguity. At this point, there's no ambiguity about the Immaculate Conception of Mary. If you don't believe it, you're not, you're not following Catholic teaching. Okay? But, but the it's, thing, it's, yeah. We, we wrote it down. But this we is signed it. off on it. Every, every Protestant church I've been in, I mean, some Protestants will say, no, no, we don't do it like that. We're always reforming, blah, blah. Okay, that maybe explains why some of them are so off the rails, if I can be a little <laughs> rude. But, but I mean, every Protestant church I've been in, if you were to walk in and go, well, I don't think the Trinity is a true doctrine. We need to settle this and debate it now. Yes. Or I believe you, the Son and the Holy Spirit are, are holy, but not the Father. Or if, I, want or, to start a new, yeah, I want to start a new heresy called yeah. antipatrianism. Or if you were to walk in and go, well, I don't think Jesus rose from the dead, and I think yeah. we need to debate that doctrine they're going to go, well, look, you're not a Christian, get out. Well, actually, they won't say get out. They'll invite you in and try to correct you on your error. But nobody yeah. will seriously entertain the debate that you can be an Orthodox Christian in good standing and believe that. Right. Ex except in those always reforming Unless churches. you're an Anglican, but because it'll accept anything. Well, I mean... Sorry, and, Anglicans, but you're... I, you're, I used to be an really Anglican. Last. It's yeah, Unfortunately, that's... Yeah, but... But I mean, I'm, unless unless you're in one of these always you reforming and I, churches that's always coming up with new ideas, maybe. But but no, but nobody, but no, no conservative Orthodox Christian, small o Orthodox Christian, let's would, say would entertain. Would, no assume, mainstream Christian church will entertain the idea that Christ was not Christ. Yes, no, no, basically right. faithful church will entertain that, be right. they Protestant, right. Catholic, or Orthodox. Like this is a settled doctrine; you don't get to argue about it. If you want to argue right. about it, you will be. If you want to argue about it and start, you know, convincing everybody of it, you'll probably be shown the door, and 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 with good reason. Well, excuse me, but, but even if you, whether you're shown the door or not, you will be arguing from outside the church tradition yeah, of that church yeah, of that exactly. denomination, 
as an outsider. You're not someone who's accepting the denomination and arguing within the tradition of what's an yeah, allowable exactly. difference of opinion. Exactly. Okay? So that's all. That's the, a good the way to put it. Papal infallibility is well, just magisterial saying, infallibility. Yeah. Magisterial infallibility is a, is a better because then it doesn't sound like the Pope is is the <laughs> greatest thing since sliced bread. It's it's like the ability of the umpire to say the goal has been reached. Okay, it's just it's yeah. just the umpire rule. But everybody the discussion has discussion is over at this point. Every, everybody okay? everybody has rules like that. Like there's no, all, all churches are like that. Um, all churches have dogmas, right? Exactly. Now, I my my Lutheran friend just recently told me that that's part of the of the Lutheran doctrine of her denomination, that if a preacher is preaching something that is incorrect according to Lutheran teaching. They are required to break away from him and set up their own church and reject the previous church, because they're actually under an, an obligation to to break up churches and start new ones. I'm not sure she phrased it that way, but that's what it sounded like to my Catholic ears. Well, it sounds like we they Catholics should just throw him not, out. <laughs> we Catholics do not have that doctrine. No, no, it's, I'm not talking about. It's not that the preacher wants to throw the guy out. It's if the guy disagrees with the preacher. If the guy no, no. reads the Bible and comes to the conclusion that the preacher is preaching her heresy. He has to start his own church and, and call the congregation away. Yes, well, he has to leave. Well, I suppose and call the, the congregation. I, away. I suppose the Catholic position is the reverse of that, which is, if he's teaching heresy, he'll be thrown out. <laughs> well, even we'll try to correct no, him, he'll, bring him back. He'll I mean, stay in and be corrected. Well, and, and, okay, and but if he stubbornly refuses, but if he won't, he won't be we'll, corrected. Then we'll, then if he we'll won't be corrected, him. he'll be thrown out. Like I mean, right? He, but he doesn't get to start his own church. We don't teach that. No, you see, but. Americans all have to. Americans, because we're Americans, all have to say that revolt against your sovereign king is permissible under certain circumstances. You know, because we did that. <laughs> well, yeah, you have to but say that. The English monarch, the the official doctrine of the English monarchy, does not have to recognize the right to revolt as a, as any sort of legal right. Well, so, likewise with the Catholic Church. So Thomas don't, Aquinas. I don't believe any Catholic teaches that you are allowed to start your own church independent of the church started by Christ. No, you're not. You know now. The Protestants are going to say, and I th uh, they're going to try to justify it and saying, no, 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 we're actually still following Christ. You guys are the ones who are out of step. But they have Fine. to say that. But well, sure, they have to. But even they recognize that the authority is derivative. It comes from Christ, hmm. you see. Now, uh, the, the, one of the funnier memes I've seen is, is a list of who started your church. And the Catholic <laughs> and the Orthodox all have Christ at the top. And everyone else is Martin Luther, you know, uh, uh, Mary Baker Eddy. Saint, Smith, Saint, Saint, Jerome has a, Saint Jerome, which yeah. I can never find the quote, but um, has a quote about that, and he basically says, "Yeah, if your if your church has a founder, if you can trace your church back to a named founder, it's not the Church of Christ. Right? It's not the Church right. Christ founded. I mean, it was harsh, but uh, and he was well, talking. My Protestant friends say that the Catholics actually can only trace their church back to Constantine or something." Or maybe well, uh, Saint that Saint Paul made it all up, and and uh, he wasn't really a Christian or, or something. Well, I don't think. But uh, well, I, Catholics don't believe or teach that. So sorry. I would. That's, I would. That's, that's, I would know a, for anybody. That's a difficult argument to make. If anybody listening who thinks the Catholic Church started with uh, Constantine, may I suggest, please go and read Saint Ignatius, Saint Irenaeus, uh, Irenaeus. Go and read um, Saint Justin Martyr. Go and go and read how they describe things like the Eucharist or church services and things like that. And you know what you're going to discover? These guys are well. These guys are Catholics. These guys are not. These guys are not proto-Protestants or early Baptist. They're not. They're Catholics. They, 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 they go to services that look like the Catholic Mass today. Right. The Catholic Mass is probably a little more today is more polished and refined, and we've had two thousand years of doing it. But essentially, it, it, I mean, I, I was shocked reading St. Justin Martyr when he describes what um, Christians do on the Lord's Day um, and how they have their service and how they bless the host and confess their sins and separate the host and send it to other churches. And, and it's just like, yeah, I've, I've been to that service. I went to that service last weekend. The service did I, I went to hit all that... the same notes. Did I mention that I'm named after him? I took Justin Martyr as my as my saint name when I joined the church. So yes, I've read him, and yes, he's Catholic. I I took Saint Boniface, but um, because I find his story incredibly inspiring. But um, I I I would have taken I'd probably take Saint Justin today, actually, to be honest. Um, but I like he's Saint, the patron saint of he's the patron saint of philosophers because he yes uh, I so he I like studied, him. 
he studied the same philosophies that I studied before I became Christian, <laughs> almost the same order as him, so I felt very close to the, to the man. Fair enough. Uh, but I also recommend reading St. Irenaeus only because the guy is funny. If I'm, if I'm remembering the right name, if I'm not confusing him, he wrote the Against Heresies. He wrote a long book uh, yep. uh, dissecting the Gnostic absurdities of where Gnostics read the Bible but don't read it to mean what uh, everyone else reads it to mean, which is one reason why I think just reading the Bible is, is very difficult to do. I'm a lawyer. I would not hand the U.S. Constitution to someone and say, tell me exactly what this means. When it says high crimes and misdemeanors for, as grounds for impeachment, what does that phrase mean? You know, It's a term of art. The, you can't interpret any ancient document without having some understanding of the context and, and having some expertise in you know, debating, the, the, debating the nuances of the theology. So, and, and I would know... That's, but that's just me. In terms of um, lineage, St. Irenaeus, um, who died towards the, was martyred towards the end of the second century, um, knew St. Ignatius at the end of his life, who was taught by the Apostle John. Like, that's, that's the lineage of these guys. They, right. they, go, they, go back, they go back to either they were taught by an apostle or they were taught by people right. that were taught by apostles. So if they got it wrong, what are the chances that you got it right? Well, that's 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 exactly because they're it. within they're within one they're with, they're one removed from Kevin Bacon. So if to speak. if if you want you to know? say they got yeah, if you want to say they got it wrong, that's fine. We can have that argument, but it's but it's, everything it's be you a know about like, your religion comes from them. Shit, like yeah, like <laughs> how do you even know Christ lived at all or that he died and rose? How it's because you, they said so. The guys you're saying are un, are, are not valid witnesses. How are you going to? I mean, yeah. How, what what's the story you tell in your head that these guys got it so wrong so quickly? Right. Um, when Christ said, uh, "The gates of hell will never prevail against the church," that's that's the now, direct words of well, Christ. Again, Let's, let's be fair to our Protestant brethren. If you ask me as a lawyer whether the early, whether the early uh, uh, Supreme Court correctly interpreted what the Constitution meant in certain cases, and I would say with the exception of Marbury v. Madison, they, they did interpret it very correctly and, and very much according to the doctrine. And I do believe that around 1930, 1940, the, the, the Supreme Court began to introduce doctrines that were alien to the basic legal thinking of the time, and, and I believe the Supreme Court became more and more corrupt to the point where they did things like legalize abortion which is, I'm sorry, it's nowhere in the in of the course. Constitution. And I happen to be old enough to live to a time when I could say, and the Supreme Court now agrees with me on that point. So they <laughs> finally came around to agreeing with John Wright. Wow. Uh, so, but if a Protestant wants to say, no, the early church was fine, but after Constantine, he made it a state church, then they became evil and repressive. And then the Protestant will say, well, what about all the corruption? You might yeah. have been holy in the early days, but, I mean, St. Saint, Saint Peter and St. Paul weren't out uh, molesting children, but, uh, you know, uh, and they weren't covering up scandals. What do you say to that? See, that's, well, that's the real argument. Did the church lose the mandate of heaven over the years Did by, by means of because they became corrupt? But um, I, when it comes to questions of church corruption, I, am, I think the simplest answer, and we, we can unpack this a bit, but uh, Hilaire Belloc uh, in the late 18th century to the early 1950s, he lived, he said... The Catholic Church is an institution I am bound to hold divine because he was a Catholic. But for unbelievers, a proof of its divinity might be found in the fact that no merely human institution conducted with such knavish imbecility would have lasted a fortnight. Um, and that's... That's just, it's perfect. Hilaire Belloc, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, was a good friend of G.K. Chesterton and they made each other wittier. So um, that's, that's a great quote. But really yeah, also, it's perfect. I, I, cannot, I cannot identify this quote as correctly as you, but once upon a time when Napoleon was talking to a priest and the, the Napoleon was threatening to destroy the Roman Catholic Church in, oh, in I've had this France, one. Yep. he said, oh, monsieur, if you, uh, you will not be able to destroy the church. If we, through our incompetence <laughs> have not, and knavishness, have not been able to, to ruin it in uh, 1,500 years, what can you do? You know. Well, this this is it. But also, so yeah, we Catholics are well aware that our church is mortal and that God has taken a crooked beam to make a straight uh, church out of. And I would not. We're 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 the church is as full of sinners as hospitals are with sick people. But okay. Jesus Jesus said this would be true too because I mean he has a parable literally where he says the wheat will grow up with the tares, and at yes. the end they'll all be pulled out and the tares burned. 
Um, for we, those of you who don't know, for those of you who don't know, a tear is a weed oh, that yeah, looks sorry. very much like wheat. Okay. That looks like wheat, and so it's almost impossible to discern and pull up beforehand before it, before it uh, flowers, before it blooms. Well, there we go. Didn't know that. Um, but at any rate, like, Christ warned this would effectively be the case in one of his parables. But, I mean, let's have some perspective. Uh, there are what? The Catholic Church has what? A billion and something people that uh, fall under its uh, banner. Despite what you've heard, we're actually the biggest church on earth. Sure. But, Some people say the Islamics are bigger, but but they're not. But at any rate, the Catholic Church is really, really massive, really powerful. Well, it has well less so these days. In the past, it's had enormous political power, enormous influence. Okay, is it a surprise this church has individuals in it that are corrupt and are there just for the power and things like? Yeah, of course. I'm I'm not surprised. If you're if you say, well, my church doesn't have any of these problems. I would say, okay, sure. Your church is probably very small. Your church is very new. Or you have these problems and you just don't know about them. Um, and, and Or you have no political power. Well, or you're, well, I mean, that would go along with being small and new. But I would not. Yeah, small, of, small, but small, new, and poor. Because the, 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 corruption is, the corruption is caused by when the church dabbles in worldly things, which all sure. churches do. But I, but I, because I had this discussion with someone saying, "Oh, my church doesn't have the problems your church does." And I said, "Okay, so what's your church?" And he said, "The uh, Missouri, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod." Uh, and I said, "How big is it?" And he says, "Oh, two million people." And I was like, "Okay." The Catholic Church just had World Youth Day, where we had a million young people committed and enthusiastic enough to fly from around the world to Portugal. Get back to me when your church is when your church is that big and i bet you'll have the same problems i right. mean like I'm, I'm not excusing that we have corruption and problems but the catholic church is a massive institution made up made up of sinners as as hilaire also, Be belloc said like you know but it's also i'm sorry it's also simply special pleading it is an illogical argument even if your church was as small as 12 men let's say you were christ and 12 apostles well, and too. one of them is a traitor <laughs> One of them is going to sell you out for 30 pieces of silver, okay? I'm sorry, everyone has these problems. Of if you course. want to compare the number of, of priests who, who molest little boys compared to the number of school teachers, my money is on, my money is on the, well, this, uh, I'll take that bet because the school teachers is 10 to 1. Well, that's actually, The, the statistics yeah. are not even close, okay? Well, that's, but that's the other thing, like, because um, I know the Catholic, the, the priestly abuse scandal will often come up when you're talking about church corruption, and here's the thing, um... Yes, it was a scandal. It was a great evil. It never should have. Absolutely. It never, ever should have happened. Yeah. Um, everybody involved uh, who was covering for those priests should be defrocked and excommunicated until they repent in sackcloth and ashes. They definitely shouldn't yep. be allowed near children again. No. Um, it was, and it was, a, yeah, it was a, it was a great crime. That being, and I, like, I don't want to minimize it. The church has a day of mourning for this now. We take it very seriously. But at the same time, like, as you said, your kids are in far more danger from uh, any particular public school teacher than they are from any particular Catholic yeah. priest. And I've never heard anyone say, oh, if only school teachers could get married, we wouldn't have this problem. But also... No one's ever said that. But also there's, there's other bits and pieces of this that people making the accusation aren't aware of and definitely don't, wouldn't like the logical conclusion to follow from. Um, Cat... The, the Catholic Church made a grave error when they first started learning about priests interfering with little boys. That they'd, they'd made mistakes. The mistakes they'd made earlier were they became more lenient on homosexuals in the clergy or same-sex attractive men in the clergy. And they changed the... So in the olden times, in older times, and they changed the rules, if a priest would have been caught doing this... He would have been confined to a monastery and kept under watch for the rest of his life. Um, right. Now you can say, "Oh, that punishment isn't hard enough." Well, look, he's basically being he's basically being confined for life and kept away from uh, being able to do this to anybody else. That's effectively right. life imprisonment. Right. And and also, uh, and I just have to say, during the nineteen fifties and nineteen sixties, there were powerful pressures in the church and people being smuggled into seminaries. I mean, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but no, the, the communists the, uh, did that. The Soviets, the Soviets <laughs> did decided that. to try it's to take record. down the church. 
It's on record. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's a historical fact. Yeah. They smuggled people into the church to try to get them into positions of power in order to communize the church. And one of the things they did is they wanted to relax the sexual mores. Yeah. The same way they were being relaxed all across the West. It was part of yeah. your sexual revolution. Okay. Now the church was too worldly and followed along with it. But exactly. in those days, the argument was made that if a guy suffered from homosexual attraction, if he put him into a church, no one would wonder why he wasn't getting married. And he would still have a function to do in society, and that he would struggle with his sin, and but would still would still have a, a useful role to play. But also, you see, hang it was on. actually done as an act of mercy, at least in some cases. Well, yeah, but there was now once lot... once of course once they started you know molesting uh, young children, then that was well that they, was outrageous, and but, those people should have been should have been punished severely. Um, but I would I'd also note that mm -hmm. at the time, the Catholic Church sought advice about what on earth to do about this. And they listened to secular sexologists who said, "Oh, you can treat this with counseling." Sexologists. Well, that's yeah. fine. But I mean, you can and treat the, this and with the counseling. Usually, you can't. <laughs> and the church usually tries to solve things through going to confession. Yeah. Because they're a confessional group, you know. Yeah, and we're let me all also sinners. mention, and we're all sinners. <laughs> yeah. And we're not gonna we're not gonna stand in judgment over you. Uh now sodomites get into heaven. You know, I'm sorry. It's it's true. Yeah. You can read Dante if you don't believe me. It's 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 not it's not a it's not an unforgivable sin. Of course. The only unforgivable sin is blaspheming the Holy Spirit, as far as I can, as far as I know. Well, but here's the other thing that I want to say about about church corruption. Sure. Uh, our corruption is bad, uh, but not when compared to the public school system, and not when compared with the Anglican Church, because we don't teach that homosexuality is licit. We don't teach that gays can marry each other. I've we don't yeah. teach any of those. Even when the Borgia Pope was keeping a mistress and having a son by her, the church teaching was not that sex out of marriage that was okay. Listen. Yeah, something is protecting the teaching of the church from the corruptions <laughs> of the teachers. Okay, yes. I think that something is the Holy Spirit. I have seen other denominations that don't seem to have that protection, and they now have priestesses and gay marriage and all sorts of rigmarole that is against traditional catholic teaching well every uh, christian teaching what am i saying catholic teaching every denomination before 1930 every single mainstream denomination used to teach that abortion was a grave moral error hmm. they changed their mind we did not who's who's the corrupt party here oh okay i, I would know the corruption is real there yeah, are sure. there are priests yeah, who, who did a little boys but the 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 church itself the spirit of the church has not been touched but that's that's exactly well. Actually, I would note um, my my Lutheran friend that I was just, when I said, "Oh, how big is your church?" Because because he said he was a Lutheran, and I said, "You you you have female clergy that are melting down purity rings to make vagina statues." Um, there's there's and yeah, there's a Lutheran female pastor that's done that, and it's like, and he's like, "Oh, she's she's not a real Lutheran." And it's like, well, okay, can, but stop demanding I count. I, I stopped counting Father James Martin then, who I think should be defrocked and thrown out of the church for what yeah, he teaches. Yeah, he, he's like, apostate. Like, he's I apostate. mean, like, if, if you don't have to we've, count her, I don't have to count him. <laughs> we've had apostate priests and bishops before. I will point to Judas one last time to say, look, the church was, was had bad people in it from the get-go. Well, I would also note... That's, that's not an <laughs> argument that we're not the real church. Because even if our church does have corruption in it, what gives you the right to break away and start your own church? It's not like it's not like you get to write a Declaration of Independence and say Christ has now given me the authority. He didn't give it to you. He gave it to Peter and to the apostles. Why well, also? Okay. Um, you well, by yeah. on what authority can you start your own church? Merely saying that the, that the old church doesn't teach the newest, the latest fad in, in in theology is an insufficient reason. Now, saying the old church has betrayed the church that's that's a very good argument, and that means you should you should join. Become a priest and start teaching the correct teaching. If you well, think that we're teaching the wrong thing, I'm also uh, in. I think it was. I don't know. If, I don't know if this is original to Peter Kreeft. I don't think it was. I think he was quoting someone else. But he observed, um, in answer to questions of, uh, you know, um, bad popes and bad priests, he said, "Have have a look at the list of um, saints of the Catholic Church. Not many of them are popes and bishops. There aren't that many popes <laughs> and bishops that are uh, saints." That are recognized yep. saints of yep. the church. So, yeah, yeah we now, know. One, we, like we're aware of the problem. <laughs> one perennial problem is that is that we have saints and some some churches don't, or they or they claim they're all saints, uh, which is the same as no one being a saint. Uh, 
and they say we pray to saints. That we're we're pagans because we worship we worship statues. And we worship I saints. I literally hang on. I literally had a a Protestant minister. I had been friends for. Well, I'd just been Facebook friends with and exchanged cordial conversations with for years. And I unfriended him over. I've had enough. I I've, I'm done. Um, who said All Saints Day is the day that Catholics worship the saints? And I said. <laughs> that's a lie that is that is an absolute falsehood that is not true and he's going no no it is and it's just like i'm done i'm i am not going to and he's a he's a he's a he was a baptist minister maybe like he was a he was a a well-regarded minister in protestant circles mm -hmm. uh, in certain protestant circles and i met him first i first encountered him as an apologist working in an apologetics ministry and honestly if he is saying that either he is so incompetent that i wouldn't trust him to operate a fork safely or he knows what he's saying is a lie and he is a wolf in sheep's clothing there's in my mind there is no other option that someone who claims to be a teacher and claims to be schooled and studied on these issues could make that claim i once had a guy online who challenged me about praying to mary and, yep. and he said, you Catholics worship Mary in the exact same way my Hindu friends worship their goddesses. And I asked him, in, when you hear your Hindu friends praying to Lakshmi or to Parvati or to any female goddess, uh, do they say, dear Lakshmi, please pray on my behalf to the one true God? Or do they say, Lakshmi, I'm... I, Grant me, grant me my my my. Uh, <laughs> here's the problem. The problem. The, the, of course, the answer is no, of course no. We don't we don't think Mary is going to save us from hell. We think Mary is the mother of the guy who's going to save us from hell. Mary points okay. us to her son. Right. She's she's completely unimportant if she hadn't had the kid. You know, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's just, well, no one would remember her name. She is the mother of God, but right. She's the mother she's of God. The mother of right. God. <laughs> right. Now, she, that confuses people because they say, well, wait a minute, Hera was the mother of God. Hera was a pagan goddess. So therefore, you think Mary is, is, is Hera. And we go, no, Mary was a mortal. Mary was yeah. human. Okay. Uh, the fact that a human could give birth to a god is a scandal and a shock. And you're not a Christian unless, you're, unless you understand that point. That's the whole point. Not that, not that Mary was important, but that Jesus was God. And that's why we're not Jews, by the way. That's, the, that's why we're not saying Jesus mm. was a prophet. We're saying he was God. He was one with God. Okay, that's the, that's the shocking, astonishing, absurd thing the yeah. cat the Christians teach. Yeah. Okay. So let me give you let me just give you a real brief answer to all this praying to statues garbage that is being li lied to about us. Worship is when you uh, uh, worship is when you sacrifice to a god. Okay. Either you take a cow and you stab it with a knife, or you offer up if you're a Christian you offer up a prayer because his sacrifice was final and complete. And you participate in his sacrifice in the modern time, because his sacrifice is eternal. What are the other? The Eucharist. Yeah. Okay. Now, during the Mass, is Mary's name mentioned at all, except for born of the Virgin Mary? Only, only in the creeds. Only in the creed, and she's only mentioned as the mother of God, hmm. right? Now, I like Mary because Mary gives me hope because Mary was human. Mary was human, and now she's queen of the angels. Okay. Mary was human, and she got into heaven. That means that means I'm a human. I could get into heaven. God going back to heaven, that's not that amazing because that's where it comes from. Okay. Now, Christ was fully human. That's also another doctrine that's, in, that's insane that we Christians believe mm. and that you have to be insane to believe and you have to give up. When I say insane, I mean insane according to what the world thinks. Yeah, of course. Okay. So, again, uh, ask your Protestant friend, is it okay when you're suffering to go to your pastor and say, Pastor, please say a prayer to God for me? Is that licit? Is that an act of pagan worship? Hmm. If your no. answer is no, no, oh, that's no, not no, pagan no, worship. I'm, I'm asking my friend to pray for me. Then I will say, I'm friends with Justin Martyr. He is alive. It says so in the Bible. It says so in the good book. The dead are only asleep, but they're still alive. I can ask my living friend who is alive to help me pray, to pray for me. Nothing wrong with that. And and that's, I agree, I, I agree but also... Um... We should note, particularly with Mary, um, the accusation is um, Catholics worship Mary. I would observe there was a sect called the Coloridians. Coloridians, yes. Um, who who did literally 
offer sacrifice and to Mary. What happened to the Caldridians, pray tell? They threw them out. They, threw they them, were they officially threw them out. anathematized. <laughs> yeah. So if you, my Protestant friend, decide that you'd like to worship Mary and you join our church to do so, you will be, be thrown, thrown out, out on your ear. <laughs> it is illegal <laughs> by our doctrine. Yeah. We have anathematized. It is a formal heresy. Yes. Okay. What more can we say? We the thing you're accusing of us is something that we teach no man can do. Yes. Okay. So yeah. I'm sorry. So it's like I'm it's sorry. like, we don't it's, do like it. it's like calling Christians it's like calling Christians cannibals because we eat Christ. Well, okay. You're just using the word to mean the opposite of what it really means. But also, um and this will sound harsh, but I think it's probably worth saying. Um part of the confusion is Catholics will say prayers to Mary and will bow before her potentially uh, before a statue sure. of her, in, in, you know, like offer, offer, offer reverence, offer sure. reverence to her, sure, um, and prayers and sing songs to her. Okay, um, have you? Have everyone, you... everyone in the Middle Ages did that to people of higher rank than them. Okay, but also, but important, barons bowed to kings and gave them presents. And also, when you want a jury, you have to pray for a jury trial in a court of law. When you submit a petition to the king. You, it's called a prayer. The word okay. means petition. Okay, so at any rate, but at any rate, like, um, Catholics worship Christ most fully in the Eucharist. We we right. literally join and take Christ's body into us during the Eucharist with the consecrated host. Right. The Mass is the highest act of worship. We, we eat him so that he can eat us, basically. Uh, yeah. we, become, we take him into us so that he will take us into him. You, 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 you. If you're going to be a Protestant, and you want to say Catholics worship Mary, you need to seriously consider the possibility. And this will sound harsh, but you need to at least grapple with the possibility that we offer veneration to Mary when we sing and offer prayer to her, usually to pray uh, on our behalf, and we we do that. And you look at that and you go, well, that's how we worship God. Maybe the problem isn't that we worship Mary. Maybe the problem is you only venerate God. And that's going to sound harsh, but yeah. you need to, you probably need to consider that possibility that actually you're falling short. We're, we're not going too far. You're falling short. Um, and I mean, like, I'm, I, don't, I don't say that to denigrate Protestants, but if if you're going to say Protestants are Catholics worship Mary, the flip side of it is, if Catholics don't worship Mary, then you don't worship God. You yeah, only you only venerate God because what's the sacrifice? You, they you don't, fall they short. don't obviously yeah. no Christian offers animal sacrifice anymore. That that was done mm. away with with Christ. But but. Obviously, again, if you're if if Christ is not present in the flesh in your in your in your church, it's not being offered to God as a sacrifice. What what is the sacrifice? How how is it how is it different from just a prayer meeting? Yeah, you know? I mean, like, and that's Protestants don't like to hear that. They get very upset and understand. It's a hard it's a it's a hard question. So, but it's a hard question. But uh, but but it's but I'm asking it in in all due sincerity. What's what's if you worship yeah. God? Worship means sacrifice. It's it, it's been that way since Abel and Cain. Okay, every act of worship in the Bible is an act of sacrifice. Christ was the final sacrifice for us, which is why we don't we don't abide by the Mosaic Law anymore. And That's we why we don't offer animal sacrifices. And we participate he did in that sacrifice in the mass. We participate in the sacrifice in the, of the in the mass. Christ we step outside of time, as it were. To, Christ to, to, isn't you know. re-sacrificed. There's there's no. details of it, and it can be discussed. But essentially, Christ isn't right. re-sacrificed in the mass. We participate in Calvary on the mass. Right. We overcome the barriers of time. It's like we're there. The yeah. same way we were there when Adam fell, because uh, that that I know in my heart I did. I helped him. <laughs> you know, I was cheering him on. I said, "Yeah, I want to be like God. I want to be. Able, I want to be able to see the good, difference, the good, and evil. You know, whatever." So, so hope, let hope, me mention. Yep, uh, let me mention. Uh, if if prayers to saints is not going to be, it, it's a non-issue. Okay, that that issue is only based on misunderstanding. Yeah, papal infallibility is only is an issue based only on misunderstanding. Faith versus works is a real issue. Okay, that you'd have to actually debate with a real theologian. The nuances of how that works out, but a good but chunk I believe of it is even these days, the the, the 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 Catholics and the Protestants and many public doctrines have said their doctrines are almost identical. They've they've come to a kind of yeah. an agreement on that point. So they, they, they that's not a major. Cases. That should not be a major issue. So then, what's the, what issue is left? 
Let me let me let me introduce an idea that I heard from G.K. Chesterton as to what the three stages of Catholicism are. We should wrap up with this. Yep. I, let, let me. <laughs> I'll say it. It's it's a perfect bookend to this whole conversation. <laughs> the first stage is you suddenly become fair-minded. You suddenly are willing to listen to what the Catholics have to say to find out if whether or not all the absurd things, all the pagan things they say and believe are actually there. And then, of course, even even a cursory examination will tell you that that's, that, that that there's something to the Catholic Church. There's got to be something there, which is to explain why our church is ten, a hundred, or a million times bigger than yours. Okay, there's got to be a there's got to be a reason. So give it a hearing. Be fair-minded about it. Now, at that point, it's too late. Once you've given us a fair-minded <laughs> reading, uh, you're you're already on the slippery slope up into heaven. This happened to this me. This is one of those slopes that slopes that slopes <laughs> upward. Yes, yes. <laughs> Because the second stage is when you become fascinated with the richness of their traditions and their and their and their rituals mm -hmm. and their complexity and their and the depth of their thought and the number of their artists and also and all sorts of things, which your young new church simply doesn't have. Your undecorated church doesn't doesn't have Dante, you know, for example. Not to mention the early church fathers. You basically have ignored your church basically has ignored all the history between between 44 A.D. and uh, 1644 A.D. You just think nothing happened during that period of time. Well, the richness is overwhelming. The, the depth of that mm. you, can, you can spend whole lifetimes just exploring how deep and wide and rich the kingdom of, of the Catholics is. Because you step inside their little church and it's enormous on the inside. It's bigger on the inside than on the outside, like a TARDIS. Then the third stage, in the final, the final stages is you get scared and run away because that's when you realize it's too it's too much you don't want to you don't want to give up contraception you don't want to have to be married for life you don't want to be faithful to your wife it's it's making too big of a demand on you you know you don't want to go into a beautiful building you'd rather go into a shoebox and so on and so forth pardon me that was a little mean on me so I, let me <laughs> take that one back but you you begin to the the you've fallen into the event horizon the, the, the gravity well is too deep, and you start to struggle to get out. And that happens to everyone. It happened to Chesterton. It happened to me. And then when you're trying to, to escape from the Catholic Church, God comes and finds you. you, you and there's you, no escape you, at that you, point. You give so, up. Yeah. <laughs> so the, basically, the problem is if you read too much history, church history, you'll fall into the Catholic Newman problem, which is the Protestant churches are not well rooted in history. I, or the rooted in make believe. I, I heard a literal. You know? I heard a literal discussion. It's not true of the Orthodox Church. The Orthodox no. have just as much. They have apostolic succession. They believe in the same kind of things we believe. They just disagree about how to run things. I was. That's not. I was listening to a talk on a, uh, saying the errors of the Catholic Church, and the question was asked: Why do why are why why are evangelicals leaving Protestantism for the Catholic Church? And they said three things. Um, they listen to Catholic apologists. Um, I think the implicit assumption was who lead them astray. They read yes. the early church fathers and the Eucharist. <laughs> and it's like, and it's like, okay, but I mean, okay, we'll leave the first one aside. But if you read the early church fathers, yeah, these guys are Catholics. There's, it's, it's the, these guys the hold the Catholic dis distinctives and the, and <laughs> the Eucharist. Once you recognize the Eucharist for what it is, where else could you go? The first time I went into a confessional booth, and I had in a lifetime of atheist sin to confess, and I got a very light sentence, I actually felt the Holy Spirit move during that moment. It was like a physical sensation. And my poor Catholic friend, my poor Protestant friends, will never know that, never know that feeling. You know, maybe, oh, excuse me, play that. You can, get, you can get the Holy Spirit through prayer. Fine. You don't need a priest to go to confession. You can confess your sins directly to God. Fine. Catholics can do that. But doing it in a formalized way with the guy who has been authorized to do it, uh, in persona it Christi. greatly it <laughs> greatly clarifies the mind because you have to actually sit there and out loud yeah. say what your sins are to a guy who's heard the same sins last week from you. Okay, so uh, when I was reading the Book of the Apocalypse, it's rich. It's the it's rich with confusing revelation. imagery, with riddles, with revelations. No, just it's uh, revelation is the book you're talking about when you say the book of the apocalypse. Yes, yes. Oh, the, but the word apocalypse is just the Greek word for revelation. Oh no, sorry, I'm not correcting you just for anyone listening who hasn't heard it called the apocalypse oh, yes, of the, John. <laughs> or the apocalypse. It's the visions that John had at Patmos. Yes, you're correct. Yes. Because I, I believe I believe our Protestant brethren call it by a different name. The book of the revelation. It's all good. That's fine. Just 
It's book. It's <laughs> specifically the book of the Revelation of of uh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, those images are uh, we we Catholics try to imitate in our mass the specific things that John sees them doing in heaven. Hmm. You see, and you can't interpret that 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 riddle successfully unless you unless you understand Catholic imagery, unless you understand the Catholic Catholic thinking. I don't think any Protestant has ever read that book and understood what it was actually talking about. You see. Because it was written by Catholics for Catholics. Well, so I didn't, one advantage I of becoming Catholic too, is that we do have a richness of tradition that explains a lot more. We have what you have, but we have the heart as well as the surface features. Which sounds harsh, but again, I mean... <sighs> and we don't allow for divorce or contraception, which is what God intends. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Protestant friends, but you're... You, if, yeah. if we're wrong, then so were your ancestors before 1930. So was your founder. If we're wrong, so is the founder of your church. Unless you, unless you started your church after 1930, in which case you're the new kid on the block and why should I listen to you? So. But yes, so hopefully um, this has been instructive for people. Um, and we I hope do... we weren't too mean. I hope we weren't I, too hard. I, I, yes, I, I hope no we one's, were No one's charitable. persuaded by... No one's persuaded by by a hard a hard word. I I hope we were sufficiently charitable. Apologies to anybody who has gotten this far and doesn't think we were. And sorry to everybody who had other things they had questions about that we weren't able to get to. We could do we could right. do it. We could do twenty episodes on this topic. I think it would. Right I think in, it would annoy right people. Your, but write in your questions and uh, and we'll uh, we'll try to answer. Them. But yeah. yeah, please um, feel free to write in and we'll see what but we can do about answering them. you and I. You and I are trying to fight a face against the mountains of madness. Hmm. And I believe that the only shovel big enough to do that is in the hands of God. I don't think we can overcome the worldly madness except by turning to something that's bigger than the world. Hmm. So we have to discuss we have to discuss this at least a little bit before we go back to talking about uh, you know, uh, how many uh, uh, sex in space or uh, or how uh, or whether or whether I prefer to live in Star Trek, whether Star Trek could beat up Star Wars, could yeah. the Death Star stop the Enterprise, that kind of this thing. This is true. These topics so. come up inevitably. But anyway, I hope people have found that informative. And like, share, and subscribe. And we'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening. Thank you.